you did, Black Shit on the Purified Drink of Water that got it is up there. Um, this next video we're going to get right into is going to be uh, Moses' body. So, excuse me um, for the way I present myself and the way I say things, but I keep it straight up and I talk to you as is. And I talk to you as I'm talking to you. So, I do sound a little... It may sound like a bigot or asshole or some of the way I say some things, but that's just me being me, and I do apologize if it rubbed you the wrong way, but at the same time, your opinion only matters to me if I chose I choose not to engage. Um, Jude Black, Shalom, Ahem, Pure, Fine, Trickle, Water, the Gatherers up there. This next video is Moses Bible. So, cue that music I like. Every day I piss money away. I am a, I'm a material slave. Trying to polish this ball in this chain. Jude verse 9 refers to an event that is found nowhere else in scripture. Michael had to struggle or dispute with Satan about the body of Moses, but what that entailed is not described. Jude 1 verse 9. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil, Satan, and arguing about the body of Moses, did not dare bring an abusive condemnation against him, but simply said, The Lord rebuke you. This event occurs in Jude. Here Jude shares with us an incident which is found nowhere else in the Bible. The question naturally arises, where did he get this information? Some say that the information was passed down by tradition. This may or may not be so. We have no definite knowledge why the dispute arose between Michael and Satan about the body of Moses. It is not unlikely that Satan wanted to know the spot so that he could have a shrine built there. Then Israel would turn to idolatrous worship of Moses' bones. As the angelic representative of the people of Israel, Michael would strive to preserve the people from this form of idolatry by keeping the burial site secret. Daniel 10 verse 21, Amplified Bible. But I, Gabriel, will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. There is no one who stands firmly with me and strengthens himself against these hostile spirit forces, except Michael, your prince, the guardian of your nation. The mere mention of the name Moses arouses different images in the minds of various folks. The death of Moses is shrouded in some mystery in the Bible. We know he died at the age of 120, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Despite his age, Moses was still in his prime when he was called home. Moses was barred from entering the Promised Land because of his disobedience at the waters of Meribah Kadesh. He led the Israelites to the very edge of Canaan and was given a glimpse of the land but he was not permitted to enter it. At the end of Moses' life, God gave Moses a glimpse of the land he had left Egypt for. Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah. Mount Pisgah has a summit elevation of 4,500 feet. That's nearly a mile. There aren't many 120-year-old men who can climb a mountain nearly a mile high and live to tell the tale. However, Moses could. He managed it by scrambling hand over hand. There was no trail wide enough for Moses, and he didn't need one anyway. If you're wondering what condition he was in, the feet will tell you. He knew he would pass away since God had told him so, and God had already set another man, Joshua, in his stead before he died. The weighty responsibility of guiding the nation was lifted from his shoulders for the very first time in the last 40 years of his life. Moses could take each step on the slope in stride with lightened shoulders. He was well aware that he was about to take his final breath at any moment. As Moses took in his final visual feast of the Promised Land, a piece of real estate that he would never step foot upon, this is what he was looking forward to the most. And that was it. God wanted him home. Moses gave up the spirit. Moses died, according to the word of the Lord. Moses passed away by himself, but in peace. The account of his passing is contained within the final six verses of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34. 
Death has a way of putting things in proper perspective, doesn't it? What a way to live. A hundred and twenty and you don't need glasses. A century and a fifth and you don't need crutches. Moses never did sit around in a rocking chair, rubbing on liniment and drinking in shore. Oh, how the Israelites will miss their late leader's wise counsel. His work among them stirred their emotions to such a degree that it took an entire month for them to mourn his passing after he had left them. But finally, that mourning came to an end. That ought to be true in our own lives. After death comes a burial, and so it was in the case of Moses. But verse 6 contains one of the most remarkable statements about the whole remarkable career of Moses. Deuteronomy 34 Verse 6, Amplified Bible. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no man knows where his burial place is to this day. Moses is the only person in the Bible whom God personally buried. Did you realize that? The Lord then hid the tomb. What made him do that? Because that grave would have been turned into a shrine. They'd still be beating a path up Nebo today erecting shrines, selling popcorn and peanuts, offering various rides, and maybe even running a tram up there with a big banner proclaiming Moses' burial place. So it was concealed. This is so crucial to the Lord that it even sparked an angelic confrontation. But the important point is this. Even if Michael is an archangel, the one whom God will use to cast Satan down from heaven, still... He did not presume to speak reproachfully to the one who rules in the realm of demons. He left all such rebuking to God. Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9, Amplified Bible. And war broke out in heaven, Michael the archangel and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, but they were not strong enough and did not prevail, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the age-old serpent who is called the devil and Satan, he who continually deceives and seduces the entire inhabited world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Michael the Archangel is depicted in the Bible in the texts of Daniel, Jude, and Revelation as a fighter angel who contends in spiritual combat. The word archangel means angel of the highest rank. Most angels in the Bible are described as messengers, whereas Michael is represented in all three books as contending, resisting, or standing against evil spirits and principalities. Michael is the name of the archangel. That name implores the question, who is comparable to God? Michael is introduced to us by the prophet Daniel. Michael refused to presumptuously render judgment. Instead, he simply announced the God's rebuke. The language of this rebuke matches Zechariah 3 verse 2, where the Lord rebukes Satan for his accusations against Joshua the high priest. Zechariah 3 Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Despite his great power, Michael remains completely submissive to the Lord. The righteous angels have a rank and are submissive to authority. Considering Michael's strength, the archangel's submission to God is all the more beautiful. We can see that submission is never meant to take away an individual's strength, or purpose, or value. The strength of Angel Michael was not under dispute, as the last mention of Michael the Archangel appears in Revelation 12 verse 7, as Satan is thrown out of heaven. Michael and the forces of heaven defeat the dragon Satan, and the devil is hurled to the earth.